If you grab your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the New Testament pastoral epistle named Titus, it's been our joy as a church to, to be taking our time to preach expositionally through this letter. And uh, we find ourselves in a very sweet part of the text that's very fitting for not only our time together two days ago on Good Friday, but here today on Resurrection Sunday. I want to read the passage we covered uh, Friday and, and see how it it leads into where we're going to be today. And so with that, turn with me to Titus chapter 3 and look with me at verses 3 through 7. Paul says to Titus, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God's good word for us this morning, church. Friday night we saw in verse 3 through 5 that all of mankind, all, are dead in sin, Spiritually dead and enslaved to fleshly passions and, and, and therefore deserving of God's righteous and eternal wrath. But God, but God in his grace, his mercy and love chose to save many. The goodness and love and grace of God planned before time to send his only son, righteous and holy, then to humble himself even further to die in the place of guilty sinners. Church, salvation belongs to the Lord. The only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. Praise God for the life and for the death, and as we gather to celebrate today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we continue in this portion of Paul's letter to Titus, we see how the triune God saves his chosen people, and then what our salvation means for us now and forever. Our portion of our passage for our main focus this morning is verse 5 through 7. Look with me at the saving work of the triune God, as we see in verse 5 and 6, it says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Here we see the fact that salvation belongs to the Lord. And in no way is it earned or accomplished by us. We also see that salvation is not just a work of one person of the triune Godhead, but of all three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. First, consider with me the detail of the mercy of the Father. It says in verse 5, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. We must understand that by nothing we bring or offer or accomplish are we saved by God. God saved us not because of us, not because of anything we contributed not by works we did or even works he foresee, foresaw us doing. This was Paul's emphasis, an important clarity. 
Romans 9.11, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. The works of those Paul's referring to, Esau and Jacob, good or bad, was not why God chose to save Jacob and not Esau. No, it was solely based on God's will. God's mercy and his work. And therefore, God is due all our praise because God is the one who saves. King David said it well in the psalm, salvation belongs to the Lord, Psalm 3, verse 8. It is essential we understand that our salvation is not due to us. We didn't get enough of our life right, and then, and then God turns an eye to us and says, okay, maybe you're worthy. No. All of our salvation is all of God and all of God alone. The Apostle Paul speaks to this important truth in other ways that we can maybe wrongly think that part of us played a part. John 1, 12 through 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, those who are believers, those who are saved, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The birth he's speaking of here is not physical birth, it's spiritual birth, it's new birth, it's salvation. A guilty sinner is saved by God's mercy, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, as we'll talk in a moment, because of the work of Jesus in their place. They're born again. But notice he says this is not of blood, meaning it's not because of that person's bloodline. It doesn't matter. It's not because of who their family was. He also says it's not of the will of the flesh or the will of man. No, the Bible is clear to teach that all mankind, apart from new birth, apart from God's gracious intervention, and the will of the natural man is opposed to God. In other words, there is no part of our will that seeks God, wants God, chooses God. Paul's clear in his letter to the Romans in a few places, Romans 8, 7 through 8. He says, For the mind that is set on the flesh, the mind that is of the flesh, not revived by the Spirit yet, is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Many people believe that mankind is generally good and therefore we have good things to contribute and even to, to give God consideration for why he should give us eternal life. But this is simply not biblically true. This is idealism and, and arrogant thinking of a fallen man, a fallen race to consider that this is our standing before the Holy God. Instead, Scripture is clear. Romans 3, 10 through 12, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is why John says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. We were desperate for God to intervene. We were desperate for God's mercy. It is God's will and choice as to who he makes alive in Christ. James 1.18, of his own will he brought us forth. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The great pillars of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, in synopsis, 
five solas inform us well, goes like this. According to the authority of Scripture alone, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. When we have a right view of God's holiness and man's utter guilt in sin, we no longer then wonder why God doesn't save more people. No, instead we're, we're humbled and amazed that God saves any of us. Praise God for his mercy and grace. For without God's great mercy, we would have no hope to be saved. Hear it again, church. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Praise the Lord. Paul continues in verse 5, speaking of the work of God the Holy Spirit in our salvation. He saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit plays the most important role in our salvation, and that is to take what is spiritually dead and enslaved to sin and make it alive. To make it full of faith in Jesus Regeneration is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. This is sometimes in Scripture called being born again. In the work of regeneration, we don't play an, a role. It's the work of God. We read this in that verse we just read, John 1.13. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We read it in James 1.18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should walk, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We read in other places like 1 Peter 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the, from the dead. John 3, 3, Jesus said famously to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So I don't contribute to my salvation and my works. No, I'm desperate for the grace of God and the mercy of God alone. I, I also don't make myself alive. right? And, and this is really not that hard to understand. You didn't choose to be made physically alive, right? You didn't get in some line and say, all right, I'm here, Let, let's do this, right? No, you were made alive. You, you were, your birth, you didn't assist in your birth, right? If anything, you were the problem, right? <laughs> we didn't choose to be born. Something happened to us. And similarly, this is what the scriptures teach us. We are passive in our regeneration the sovereign work of God in regeneration was described well by the prophet Ezekiel God promised he would give an, a new spiritual life to his chosen people Ezekiel 36 26 I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh what is dead must be made alive. And in that regeneration, we see and savor the gospel and believe. We live out the gift of faith. Praise God for the Holy Spirit's work to give us new birth, to give us regeneration, so that we can trust Jesus, our Savior and Lord, by faith. This brings us to the necessary substitutional sacrifice of God the Son, Jesus Christ. Right? 
The Spirit whom he poured out on us richly, it says in verse 6, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Church, this is what we celebrated on Good Friday just a few days ago. The historic day on that annual calendar where we slow down to humbly remember the costly sacrifice of Jesus in our place. Salvation is found in Jesus alone. There is no other name under the sun by which we can be saved. Jesus himself said this. Uh, many in our modern world want to balk at the exclusivity of the gospel. Because the world's agenda is to speak lies and to, to promote the broad road, the all-inclusive road, the many ways to heaven concepts that the devil has drummed up, many have grabbed hold of. No, there is but one way. Jesus himself said it. So you don't need to be mad at me or this church or even Christianity, if you have an issue with that, you have an issue with Jesus himself who said very clearly, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying he's the way, but understand, he's not saying that he points you to the way. He points you to eternal life. No, no, he is the way. He is the truth. He is life. You can't therefore just know about him. No, you must know him personally. You must belong to him in faith. When Jesus says, I am the way, he's saying, I'm the only way to reconciliation with God and to eternal life. We're going to see in a moment, Jesus is the only way to the resurrected life. To experience true resurrection from spiritual death to life, you must surrender your life and give it to Jesus. This is true salvation, not just to believe about him, but to trust your life to him, where he's not just conveniently your savior and then you go on to live your life the way you want to no scripture is clear for those whom he saves he is our lord he's our master paul said it so clearly in all of his letters that his greatest joy after salvation was to be a slave of christ to live his life in obedience to his master Jesus is the way, meaning he's the vehicle. And so therefore, he's not a co-pilot to help you navigate life's bumpy roads and show you the secret entrance. No, he is the vehicle. He is the one who is in control. Therefore, you must give up piloting your own life to do your own life on your own terms. Salvation, trusting him, is to die to yourself, to confess your sin, and give your life to Jesus. It is his way or the highway, literally to hell. This is the teaching of Holy Scripture. To, to, to devalue that, to, to say you don't like that, is to stand in really great arrogance before the Creator as His creation and to essentially make light of His holiness and to make too much of man, fallen man. Jesus in this is confronting the lies of society, that, that church we still largely face today. There are a lot of people and a lot of man-made religions claiming to know the way or have the way. But there still is only one way. All other means of other man-made religions or irreligion do not lead to God or eternal life. 
We live in a culture right now that is making a full frontal attack on the, this very claim of Jesus. You have people who even claim that they're Christians, who claim that they're surrendered to Jesus, and yet they deny this truth by trying to appease the world's thinking that we can be more tolerant to other ways. That the loving thing to do is to be open-handed to other methods of spiritual identity and that that's to be done in the name of love. But, but hear me clearly, this is a deception of the devil because it is not loving. If you understand and believe what Jesus is saying here, it is not loving to say to a Mormon or a Buddhist or an atheist that their way is good for them and you support them. That's not loving. Why? Because they don't belong to, they don't trust in the only one who is the way to eternal life. To endorse their lies, not to love them, it's to hate them. And it brings with it the most serious consequences. Now let me be very clear. Christians should love, befriend, get to know, serve people who reject the gospel, who take up their own way, believe even in false religions, We've, we should be willing to break bread with them, serve them, love them, so that we can testify to them the truth of the gospel. To really love them. To help them see and understand their sin and their desperate need for the Savior. But what we don't do is to affirm them, endorse them, or call what they believe or are committed to good or good for them. Because it's not. It's not kind. It's damning. It's anti-God. It is a lie. And it equals eternal lostness for those who believe it. Join me, church, in complete gratitude that God even made a way for any of us to be saved. This is his mercy and his grace. When we see the full indictment of our guilt in sin before his holy standard and law, then we are truly humbled and amazed that God even made a way through Christ for many to be saved. Holy Scripture is so clear that through the person and work of Jesus alone can we be saved. Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Jesus' sinless life and substitutionary atonement alone are the sufficient means for our justification and reconciliation to God the Father. And this leads us to, G to Paul's next point to Titus that we find in verse 7. He says, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That word heirs is special. Paul loves it. He uses it often in his writings. And I think when we begin to understand what we have in Christ as heirs, it's special to us too. Church Galatians 3.29, if you are Christ, you belong to him then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is not an heir to belonging to Christ because of bloodline to Abraham, but according to God's covenant, his promise for his elect, a people of, of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Romans 8, 16 through 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs 
with Christ. To be a fellow heir means we receive all of the inheritance as those who belong to the kingdom of God. All of God's blessing is shared by all of the true believers in Christ alone. The Gentile does not receive a lesser amount of God's blessing than the Jew. The, the, the person saved in the last moments of their life does not receive a lesser amount of God's blessing than those who serve God most of their life. We're talking about God's favor, what it is to know God, to be reconciled to him. For he is the prize, church. Yes, there are spiritual rewards that we can reap in our obedience for eternity, but we're talking about the, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's Paul's words in Ephesians 1.18. And to understand, church, that's our inheritance too if we're in Christ. The riches of God's glorious inheritance is to know God and to be with God forever. Oh, how rich we are in Jesus. That being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We who have been saved by God, who have been reborn and trusted our lives to Jesus in faith, we have hope for eternal life because, now watch this, of Jesus' resurrection. This is so important that you grasp the fullness of this today, and without it, maybe you're missing why this day is as important as it is. The very thing we gather to celebrate on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus, we have hope for eternal life because Jesus lives. Because Christ has risen. Because if he didn't rise, not only would we not have hope for salvation and resurrection, we'd have no hope for eternal life. But because he lives, we can live through him and we can trust that we will be with him forever. This brings us to ask an important question. Why is the resurrection of Jesus so absolutely essential to our faith, to our hope, and hope for eternal life? A couple of key answers. First, our hope for resurrection is absolutely dependent on the resurrection of Jesus. Think about this with me. We would have no hope for new life if Jesus didn't resurrect from the grave after paying for our sins. Paul adds this clarity to the passage I read at the opening of the service, that according to the scriptures, he died for our sins and was buried and rose on the third day. According to the scriptures, later in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19, Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. Church, if Jesus did not rise from the grave, then it would mean God was not satisfied with the atonement for sin that he made in our place. If Jesus didn't rise, how can I expect that I will rise? Based on what? Without the victorious resurrection of Jesus, we, we who have placed our faith in li and life in Christ alone would have no hope. If it's only for this life, then as Paul says well here, we are to be pitied. That is most pitiful. Understand with me this morning, the very foundation, now watch this, of the idea of hope is that it's resting on someone or something to deliver in the future. 
So in other words, what are you hoping in or what do you or who are you hoping in? Your hope is in something to happen in the future. That's what hope is. If Christ did not deliver himself from the grave, on what basis would we hope that he's going to deliver us from the grave? But because he took on all our sin and satisfied God's wrath do that sin, declared it was finished, and then rose victoriously from the grave on the third day, we have great hope. P Peter says we have living hope. Th that means it's not a hope that's like, it's kind of big on Resurrection Sunday. It's not really big on next Wednesday or June 25th or, you know, it's fleeting. It's, it's kind of all over. No, no, it's living hope. It's constant hope. Why? Because it's not based on our circumstances. It's not based on how good this life is going or not. It's based on on Jesus' resurrection and power to deliver on his promises. So here's how Peter says it in 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There it is. Much of all of what Paul is telling Titus in our passage, Peter is proclaiming here. According to God's great mercy, he causes us to be born again, regeneration. God acted. Great mercy. He showed up. Jesus showed up. He lived without sin. He willingly bore the weight of God's wrath due our sin and did it completely, finished it. Didn't get partway through it and then bailed. He finished it. The work of atonement is complete. The work of atonement on our behalf it's complete. Because of his great mercy, he's caused his elect people to be born again. We are spiritually born unto new life in Christ. We are spiritually made alive so that we too can live the resurrected life in Christ. I love how John says in his first letter, 1 John 4, 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We might move from death to life and then live and serve and testify through Christ, living the resurrected life. Church, the hope we have is not empty or fleeting or vain. It is genuine. It's rock-solid hope. Why? Because it's not built on baseless superstition. We don't think that we've put together some pieces of the puzzle or, 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 or we said some kind of weird spiritual mantra just right and the right phrasing and pace, and then I think we're good. No, no, no. Jesus did it for us, and he resurrected from the grave. Our hope is in him so it's living. It carries us through. We're confident that we who belong to him, who stand before God in judgment based on his righteousness, will be forever his, adopted, justified, and glorified. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When God gives us new birth and saving faith, we trust all of our life 
to Jesus for salvation. When we do this, we're trusting the resurrected Savior. Notice the difference. He's not a long dead and gone Messiah like all the other man-made religions. This is why our faith abounds, church, and even the hardest times. And even some of the hardest circumstances that we face. Because our hope is living. It's active. It's thriving in the living Christ. In the victorious Savior who reigns on high. May the fact of Jesus' resurrection today be for you, Christian, not just a great historical fact, but a very present place for you to put your feet down after what feels like being lost at sea for a long time. And let it move you in faith to press on to win the prize that he set before you. Christian, in Christ, your victory is secure. It may not look in different quarters of the game like you're going to win. But God does not lie. And all of his promises are true. And he makes it very clear In Christ, we win. Amen? Like the old great hymn says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. The victory of our bloody champion on the cross is our victory too. He is the firstborn of the redeemed family of God. Truly the forerunner for all who trust in Jesus alone for salvation, reconciliation, and our future resurrection. And this brings up another important reminder. Why is the resurrection of Jesus so absolutely essential to our faith and hope and eternal life? Because our justification is endorsed by the resurrection of Jesus. The Word of Truth Catechism defines justification this way. God declares a believer not guilty based on the believer being credited Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness. Uh, listen to how Paul speaks to this in Romans 4, 23-25. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The verse clarifies that by raising Jesus from the dead, God approved of Jesus' work on the cross for our sins. Some have said it was God's amen to Jesus' proclamation, it is finished. God put his stamp of approval on it as affirmation. The penalty for our sin had truly and indeed been paid. No guilt remains. Christ's resurrection is the final proof that he indeed earned our justification before the holy God. Late great pastor, theologian Jonathan Edwards said it like this, if Christ were not risen it would be evidence that God was not yet satisfied for our sins. The resurrection is God declaring his satisfaction. He thereby declared it was enough. Christ is thereby released from his work. Christ, as he was mediator, is thereby justified. Christian, when you are feeling tempted to wonder if what Jesus did on your behalf is enough, Scripture makes it clear, is enough. It's enough because Jesus finished his atoning work on the cross. He didn't say, I'll get back to it. 
All of your sin, past, present, future, if you belong to Jesus, is paid for. The wrath of God has been satisfied. Do it. Church, it's enough because he was raised for your justification. You don't have to wonder if you're justified before the holy God if you belong to Christ. Jesus did what was required and his resurrection endorses this in the most amazing way. Can I encourage you to not play the fleshly game that some of us can find ourselves in where you're second guessing your standing with God? Hinging it wrongly to some place you're in, some depth of the valley you find yourself in. Remember, be reoriented by the good truths of God's word that your justification is not based on your performance. It's, based, it's not based on your ability to toe the line. It's not based on you in any way. It's based solely on Christ. This is good news. It's based on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And this is why we gather every week on Sunday in corporate worship. Why true Christians love Sunday. We work our weeks for Sunday. We protect our weekends for Sunday worship. We don't do weekends like secular people anymore. No, we protect Sunday morning because we want to gather and worship the resurrected King because his resurrection is not just meaningful one Sunday a year. It's meaningful to us every day throughout our life. And so we look forward to gathering with the saints to worship the resurrected king. Amen? Church, do you see? None of this is possible if Jesus is still in the tomb. It is a great gift of God that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we can live through him and have true living hope for eternal life with him. Do you see today that the life of one who is saved is a life of resurrection? That's another important thing we must grab hold of. It's a life of radical devotion to God. That there needs to be a good and right conviction if somehow you have laid claim to, I've been saved by God, born again, had the Holy Spirit put in me, and then just found a way to check out. There's nothing casual or haphazard about the resurrected life. To know Jesus is to be born again. It's resurrection from my old fleshly ways and wanderings. Now for many, what can happen is maybe salvation does happen. And, and then there's, a, you're, you're adopted. But then it's like you find your way back to the streets. And, and what you need to see is in you, the youthfulness of your faith, you need the blessings of the church and of the word to grow that faith. I don't care how old or young, smart or not so smart you are, we all have an infancy in faith that needs to mature in sanctification. And so I pray that there is a righteous conviction to see that life in Christ is a commitment to Christ in all of my life. To those whom he gives saving faith, we trust him with all of our lives. He reigns on high as our king. He's my authority. He's my greatest love. I love him more than my spouse, more than my kids, more than my favorite things in this world. He is my highest affection. And as I grow in Christ... He wonderfully, radically creates a greater and greater devotion to him, obedience to him, love for him. And so we, we do grow in our hunger for the word. We grow in 
uh, our love for accountability and the beauty of walking and being known in the church, serving with our brothers and sisters, submitting to our shepherds and being willing to risk in our testimony to unbelievers. This is the resurrected life. This is, you could look at it this way, is the difference between loving the Savior on Friday and being devoted to the resurrected Lord of Sunday. For those of you who have drifted away, you've found a way to to some disobedience. You you found a way to start making the primary things of God secondary in your life. I can think of no better day than for God to do business with you. Resurrection Sunday, 2023. To give you a a real conviction and and confession of the sin, of how you've still made it about you, and, and a devotion to the Lord and His Word and His people and to his commission on our lives. I I love to see how that transformation is happening in families and in parenting. I love to see how how it's affecting marriages. I love to see how it's helping those who are older finish strong and have a legacy, not for their job or their family or their car they rebuilt, but for their faith. It's a legacy that was imparted then to others who were really blessed by their testimony and finishing strong. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. May it be for the glory of the Lord Jesus that nothing would get in your way but to serve him. God gave Jesus perfect life to be tortured and murdered in our place so we could be forgiven. Then Jesus rose from the grave so that we could rise to the newness of life. So we could build our lives on the rock and no longer fumble around trying to make it work on the sand. I want this to be a blessing to you, a help to you. Hear me clearly, there is no hope apart from the cross of Jesus. Your sins are real. God's wrath is real. Hell is real. But so is the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ our Lord, our resurrected King. To close this morning, Jesus said something very poignant to his good friend Martha. Gospel of John, chapter 11 25 and 26 records it this way. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked a really important question. He said, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Meaning all that I've just said about who I am, what I'm able to do, and how resurrection is only found through me. Do you believe this? It has to be personal. It has to capture you, captivate you. You can't just be impressed by it. You can't just know it in your head. Believing it means trusting your life to it. It means joining Jesus. First, he made it clear by taking up our cross, dying to ourselves. Second, to join him in resurrection. Is she willing to die to herself and live for Jesus? Because she understands there's no hope apart from him. He is her only hope. The question is, is He now the prize of her life, the one worthy of her entire life, worthy of her worship and the devotion of her days. And so I ask each of you individually, not the person who brought you, not your spouse, not your parent or your child, you, 
Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus alone is the resurrection and the life? The Messiah who came down from heaven, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, do you believe your life into him in such a way that you no longer reign, he does? And can I just be clear, like, that's not a one-time belief. That's not a belief you had on a certain day so many years ago. That's not just a belief you have today because it's really convenient because you're in church and it's Easter. No, it's a lasting belief. Scriptures testify again and again, the truly saved are transformed, they're progressively sanctified, and they remain in faith to the end, that God loses none of his. If you're saved, then you will trust him and follow him and grow in him every day. I love how Paul said what this looks like, Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Let me just pause for a second. I didn't do this first hour, but let me just help you digest that. That means you. Put your name there. That person, that person's ego, that person's accomplishments, that person's successes and values and perceived importance has been crucified with Christ, is dead. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So that now, growingly, as people get to know you, they can't help but get to know Jesus. Because you're crazy devoted to him. The life I now live in the flesh, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's, it's not that we arrive in salvation. Let's make that clear. There's a lot of growing to do, right? Right? Has an infant arrived just because they're here? No, they have a lot of growing to do. And it's going to be hard. But there is a really important way that we do it. And and here at Disciples, we're really committed to it. And it's to say, in every turn, what does Scripture say? Let's look to God and let Him instruct us and guide us and teach us and mold us. Scripture is clear. If Jesus is not your Savior and Lord, the call on you is to confess your sin, to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Trust your life to him. Be saved. Another way to think about it is when you look at the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you need to realize that either Jesus died for you, suffered, and then rose for you. Or you will die and suffer for eternity. I pray that no one would leave here today an enemy of God, still in their sin, still arrogant and prideful, but are humbled instead, joyful, that you begin to understand why the church loves to sing together, why many people who aren't good at singing love to sing together, because it's not about the performance, it's about him, the one who we celebrate, because I love him. I don't care what you think about how rad of a singer I am or not. I just love Jesus. And I love that we love Jesus together. May we live lives of resurrection in the power and love of Christ and be forever changed. Stand with me, church. Let's pray and let's sing together and worship him this Resurrection Sunday morning. Father, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity we have had to to be here. 
the unique ways that you, Holy Spirit, move to bring an invitation or a conviction to attend. And really a divine appointment. Because it's a wonderful way by which you work. If we who are speaking the words of God are doing that faithfully, you do an amazing work. Power of the Holy Spirit moves on lives. So in the, all the wonderful ways that this feels convicting and personal and, and for, me, for each individual here, it's not because of anything I did. It's because of what you are doing in these people's lives. And oh, how I pray that they are seeing something they haven't really seen before and hearing it in a way that it's not just information and history, it's personal. And it's changing their convictions and affections and faith is emerging, a a longing for you to know you, to serve you. That We who belong to you and kind of have found a way to stall out and found a way to kind of make it about us and kind of get caught up in in a pity party about the, the, the depths of the valley we find ourselves in, but that we would be reoriented, we would be reminded, we would be renewed the goodness of the gospel, the the power of the resurrection, that again, it would not just be historical, it would be right now and, and at work in our lives. Oh, how I'm so excited to see what will come of this, your work through your word today. And in any way that anyone here is feeling Silly or, or, or embarrassed, Lord, again, let them not make it about them. Let them be humbly joyful to just say, here's where I'm at. And, and here's what God's doing. So that we can rally together and grow in you and serve you with these days you give us. We're not promised tomorrow. Oh, God, be worshipped by us today. And I thank you for your mercy the Spirit's regeneration, the Savior's sacrifice and victory over the grave, and the hope it gives us for eternal life with you, our God. This mystery you've made known, and we want to worship you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.